are coming in from the waiting room as we speak. Perfect, looks like folks are in. All right, welcome everyone. I'm uh, very happy to have you all here today for our athlete specific BPK uh, info session. Uh, just to give you an idea of what to expect, we're going to have the chance to speak a bit about the programs generally, what to expect for your first year. Uh, we also have Lindsay Butterworth here who will be able to speak to some of the NCAA side of things. Um, and you'll very specifically be hearing from Sophie Dunbar, who is the academic advisor for BPK, and Aidan Wickey, who is the student success coordinator uh, for the Faculty of Science. Uh, I'll be emceeing, so I'll keep an eye on the chat for any questions to make sure we get to them during the Q&A. Uh, and then we also have Nicole, who's on the back end. So without any further ado, I will turn things over to Sophie. So hi there, everyone. I think we've got a small group here with us today. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about, uh, generally about what you will be studying in BPK. This is our anatomy lab. It was renovated a few years ago. We're very proud of it. Um, great facility. Um, you will be taking courses that lead to a strong understanding in human anatomy, physiology, movement, neuroscience, and health. And uh, our professors and students are inv involved in fundamental and applied education, sorry, research, education, and service. Um, we provide opportunities for students to get involved in research throughout their degrees if they choose. And we have a very strong co-op program. Now I know for varsity athletes, trying to get some research in and trying to, to get a co-op in is sometimes a bit tricky, but um, work with us if you are interested and we will try and make it work for you. We think it's a great opportunity. So we have three different majors um, and you're probably aware of that. We have a kinesiology major with or without the concentration in active health and rehab. We have a biomedical physiology major and we have a behavioral neuroscience major. And I'll tell you a little bit about each um, in turn. So kinesiology major, uh, you will focus on human structure and function and their relation to health and movement. You'll study the whole body. You'll study exercise, nutrition, rehabilitation, occupational ergonomics, health behavior and promotion. As I mentioned, you can do the KIN general with or without a concentration. The KIN degree is automatically recognized by the British Columbia Association of Kinesiologists. It's the only one of our majors that is automatically recognized. This is important because for employment purposes, um, a lot of employers want our students to be registered, our students and also once they graduate our alumni with the BCAK. So um, you may wanna consider that when you're trying to decide um, which degree to take. Our kin major with the concentration is our most popular degree. Um, the, the, however, having said that, the general kin program provides the, the greatest flexibility. So sometimes when we've got students who are not sure if they want to do biomedical physiology or kinesiology, because of the flexibility, they may choose um, kinesiology. Um, and of course, as it says in the name, um, the kinesiology major with the concentration or without is particularly um, suited to going on and doing a master's in physical therapy or a master's in occupational therapy. Um, okay, so behavioral neuroscience, sorry, biomedical physiology. This degree um, is a little bit more cellular. It's, um, you will do a little bit of extra chemistry. You will do a, a little extra MBB. And so you study the human body from the cellular muscular right up to the behavioral level. Um, as I've mentioned, you're gonna do a little bit of extra chemistry and MBB, more than the B news or the kins do. This is the degree that some students choose if they're interested in medicine, dentistry, optometry, and it's also great for the growing uh, biotech industry, um, pharmaceuticals, biotech. You can still go into medicine with kinesiology and, you, and, and also be new but just sort of so you get a sense of some of the differences. Uh, behavioral neuroscience. This is a relatively new degree. It's, it's exciting because it's a combination of BPK and psychology. Um, you're going to study systems and sensory motor neuroscience, cognitive neurosciences, including attention, learning, and memory, neurological disorders, 
uh, biological rhythms, general physiology, psychology, research science and behavior and studies. So you can see, you can, it's, it's, um, it's the human body and the human brain. You can see how the two mesh nicely with the BPK and the psychology. Um, so again, this degree is great preparation for professional schools, but for some degrees, uh, for some students who want to go on and study, uh, study clinical psychology, which usually requires a master's and, and in many cases a PhD, um, this degree is great for that as well. And I think um, this is over to Aidan. Thank you, Sophie. So hi, everyone. Uh, just to get a, a feel for the room, could you all put into the chat which program you're in? Sophie mentioned there are three programs in BPK. So the program that you're in or the program that you're intending to go into, if you could put that in the chat, would be really helpful. So I'd like to tailor my uh, part of the presentation to what you're looking for. So I'm going to talk about uh, the programs themselves um, in terms of the courses and what it takes to uh, complete the program. So your degree is 120 units. Um, I'm actually going to share my screen right now. It's the easiest way I find to do is to, sh um, and I'm, someone might just need to enable screen sharing for me. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so seeing no uh, messages in the chat, I'm gonna pick kinesiology because it's the most popular uh, program that we have as Sophie mentioned. Um, so if you can see my page, um, this is a very useful page, by the way, Sophie's going to re reference it later on, uh, but this is the BPK forms page. Uh, we're going to pick the kinesiology uh, program, and we're actually going to pick the, um, I'm just going to pick the kin major active health planner. Okay, so this is a great and very useful form. I highly recommend um, that students use this for their course planning throughout their whole degree. This is a fillable PDF, by the way, so you can continue using it. And Sophie will appreciate it if you've filled this out before your meetings with her. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, 120 units for your degree. So that's, um, just so you know, most courses at SFU are three units, okay? Um, this first page here has all your lower division courses that are required for the degree. Lower division refers to 100 and 200 level courses, okay? So you're typically taking those in your first two years. You can see here that in the left-hand column, um, there are some introductory BPK courses as well as first year science courses. So uh, your first year math, chem, physics, bio, uh, you'll see students from all over the life sciences in those courses. In the right-hand column, you can see electives. So electives are courses that you can do, and you can choose these um, from any of the courses offered at SFU. They don't, do not have to be science courses. In fact, you do have uh, breadth courses. So you do want to take a couple of humanities courses, a couple of social sciences courses, and a W course. And perhaps Nicole can put into the chat. Um, there's a list of, of breadth courses so that you're aware of those. Um, you additionally have some free electives. Uh, very quickly, just to show you what your upper division courses looks like, and I'm not going to go into this in depth because you don't need to worry about this for your first year, uh, but these are your third, 300, 400 level courses. Um, there are 45 units in total for upper division, so that's 15 courses. Um, and as you can see that if you look at the course names, they start to become more specialized, more specific. Um, so students often find by the time they get to their upper division, they've really focused in on certain areas that they're interested in. Um, the, the program is very broad. There's a lot of different ways you can take this degree. Um, so if you already mentioned a couple different things, you know, active health, rehab, ergonomics, um, you'll start to understand that and learn that after your first couple courses, especially BPK 142, which is intro to BPK. It's a survey course where you'll get a very broad understanding of, of all that's uh, part of the program. I briefly want to mention that there is ability to do an honors uh, in uh, an honors degree. Basically, it involves taking some extra courses in your uh, upper division. So there's actually 15 more units to take. You would come up with a thesis, so some sort of question that you're going to ask, and you do some research on that and then report on it. So this would involve you uh, collaborating with a lab. So you, you find um, a supervisor, so a prof um, in the department you, you can work with. 
Uh, this is something to think about for the future if you're very interested in research. Um, and of course, this will be something that you understand more as you, you've taken some of the lower division DPK courses and kind of have a feel for the profs and um, the different fields of study um, within the program. Uh, so that's kind of the broad overview. Uh, please do enter some questions in the chat if anything didn't make sense. I'm going to go back one page to the forms page. Uh, if you're interested in any of the other programs, they are listed here as well. Um, I also want to mention that you do have the ability to do a minor. Um, this, what I showed you was, was what it would take to complete a kin major. Um, some students will add a minor onto their degree. A minor can be completed in any other department or faculty at SFU. Um, it, a minor is easier to get into and it re requires less courses. Um, we've seen some very interesting combinations of majors and minors. I've had, um, you know, kin majors with business minors, for example, or other arts related minors. Um, so that's another option. If you are interested in a minor, we recommend you first consult the website of the department which you're interested in because um, they often will lay out very clearly what the requirements are to get into the minor and to complete the minor. Okay. And I think it's back to Sophie, so I'm going to stop sharing here so that the PowerPoint can go back. Um, okay, so I think this is the part that a lot of you are probably waiting for. You are probably starting to look at loading your course cart, and you probably have lots of questions about how many courses should I take, which courses should I take, et cetera, et cetera. So um, Lindsay will speak a, a, bit, a bit more about that later on in the presentation. You do need to be in 12 units as a varsity athlete, and so um, how you combine your four courses, um, we'll, be, we'll discuss that a little bit as well. So don't underestimate the courses. 12 units is equivalent to about 36 hours, just in terms of uh, keeping up with the readings, keeping up with the assignments, um, you know, when you've got uh, doing a review just to keep up so that when midterms come and finals, you're not cramming. Um, we are a tri-semester system. So if it's possible, and uh, I think Lindsay will touch on that later on as well. If you are taking 12 units in the fall, 12 units in the spring, you can pick up a couple of courses in the summer. Um, and uh, so what I wanted to show you um, here where it says resources, um, it's that page that um, Aidan went to already. And uh, so the breadcrumbs are a BPK website, undergraduate students, and then um, current students and forms. Maybe Aiden, you can um, share that screen again, please. Sure, give me one second. Okay, let me know if you can see it. I can see it now. And can you go to the Kin major active health um, the course map. Sorry, it's taking. It looks like it's taking a little while. It must to be a big file. It's taking a lot to load, or yeah. my computer is just slow. <laughs> Probably both. So I I will I'll keep talking a little while this is loading. This is a very recent document for us. Um, Nicole has, it was created by someone else and Nicole has gone in and made lots of improvements to it. This is your entire degree. There's the planner that Aiden showed you and there's this document as well. And why we love this document is, again, this is only for the active health and rehab concentration, but this shows you year one, year two, year three, year four. It shows you what the, prerequisite, what the prerequisites are for each course, or if they have co-requisites as well. And this is really important because in BPK, we're very strict about prereqs. 
And um, one of the things that Lindsay had asked me to, to talk about, and it's, it's relevant to all of our students, whether you're an athlete or not, is that there are certain um, prerequisite courses that are really, really important to get done in a timely manner. For instance, BPK 205 is one of the prerequisites for almost every upper division BPK course. So BPK 205 is required for almost all third and fourth year courses. So you need to have that course done in a timely manner. Now BPK 205 itself has prerequisites. So if Aiden clicks on 205, two things will happen. You can see what the prerequisites are there. Biology 101, Chem 121, um, sorry, not Chem 121, Chem 281, Physics 101 and Physics 102. Um, so you need to get those done in your first year, first year and a half or two, I should say. Um, and so I really like that course map because as I said, lots of useful links on there. So hopefully between the program planner and this um, course map, you will find it really useful when you're trying to um, plan your courses. And of course, when, when Aiden clicked on that, it takes you to the calendar description. So where you have a choice of electives, it, it, you, you don't wanna just go with the course title, you want to read a little bit more about the course and, and this takes you to the calendar description. So if we can go back to the um, regular presentation now, that would be great. So this is what I wanted to, um, so this is what I wanted to spend a little bit of time um, with you. So that first, this is, you have some choices here, um, but this is just one sample. So this student has chosen to do BPK 142, Chem 120, Physics 100 and Psych 100. So, Physics 100, for this, this student didn't do Physics 12. So they have to do Physics 100, which will count as a general elective for them before they can go into Physics 101. So if you look at this, so in, in a lot of the materials, you will see Chem 121-4 is listed. Chem 121-4 was actually split up into two courses, Chem 120-3 and Chem 125-1. And that it was split up because of COVID. So as it turns out, for a varsity athlete who wants to be in 12 units, but not more, that's kind of a nice feature because doing this schedule, BPK 142, Chem 120, Physics 100, and Psych 100 gives them exactly 12 units. If you have, if you've completed Physics 12 and you have a great mark, you don't have to do Physics 100. You can do Physics 101. Um, Psych 100 is listed because it's a breath social science. Um, so it'll count as one of your, your WQB requirements, your breath requirements. For students who are uncertain, they may be interested in doing our BNU major. Uh, Psych 100 is also core. There's lots and lots of BSOS courses. It doesn't have to be Psych. One of the reasons why I list Psych 100, if you are ever interested in doing a, um, a master's in physical therapy, UBC, Master's of Physical Therapy, requires three units of Psych. So what you're doing with this is you're fulfilling multiple requirements. You're getting your breath social sciences and you're satisfying your um, requirements of a psychology course for your MPT, okay? Um, so there's another sample um, term one below. This student is choosing to do biology 101, which is four units, chem 120 and 125. So that's the lab that goes with, one, with chem 120 and math, 150, math 153. Now, if you add that up, that's only 11 units. So that will not satisfy your requirements as a varsity athlete. So what a student might do again is what they would do in this particular case, they would again leave Chem 125 till their second term and they would replace it something like a psych course or an English course. If you're interested in keeping your options open for medicine, med school requires six units of English, but and English 111, 112, 113, 114, 115 will satisfy your breath humanities, your lower level writing, and it will satisfy the requirement for medical school. I hope I'm not speaking too fast. I'm, this this is, is going to be recorded. 
I want to make sure that we get through everything so you have um, a chance for some questions. So in that particular case, by swapping out the chemistry 125 lab and replacing it with an elective, you're in 12 units again. So these are only, this is only two sample, um, sample terms. So as an athlete, you may say, you know what? There's certain courses that, certain science courses that I'm weaker in. Can I do two science courses and two electives? Yes, you certainly can do that. But there are, you, as you will note from the program planner, and if you go to the course map, you can't keep doing just one or two science courses per term. Eventually, you will end up using all the room for your electives up. You won't have any more space for any more electives. And you will, you're going to, you'll get into trouble with the prerequisites. You won't be able to continue on with your degree. And so you will have to take a, a term somewhere where all of a sudden you're doing a whole bunch of hard hard courses. So if you, if you want to create um, a schedule for yourself, and if you want to reach out to either Lindsay or to me, me first if you want to, and just to say, um, there's another document actually that we should show you, and that is suggested first year enrollment. The su suggested first year enrollment is same place that Aiden took you under forms, and that actually goes into term one, a sample term one two and three, and also gives you um, information on year two. So that's an amazing document because we wanna make sure that you're comfortable um, setting up your term one, but if you wanna do a little bit more planning into your spring term and your summer term, that document is very helpful. And um, so now, yes, let's move on to this one. So be prepared. Um, if you are in one of our majors, we're competitive entry. And once you're in, you also need to uh, maintain a certain GPA to continue in the program. That is in, in effect between 24 and 90 units. We do this because we want to give students a chance to come in and adjust to the university setting. It's a huge um, transition between high school and university. So we don't want to, um, if you struggle a bit in your first term of 12 units, um, we want to give you some time to sort things out, to get some help and to, um, so it's in effect between 24 and 90 units. It is not your cumulative GPA, it is a science GPA. So only courses that are in, uh, science courses that are in science departments. Some people get confused because they do a health sci course. Health science courses are in the Faculty of Health Sciences, they wouldn't count. So it has to be a course that's considered in the Faculty of Science. There's more information about that on the BPK website in our FAQs. There's also a GPA calculator on our website. The university has a generic uh, GPA calculator. We have some uh, BPK specific ones. Limit on repeats. The university only allows students to do in most, uh, under normal circumstances, you're only allowed to repeat a total of five courses and you can only repeat a particular course once. If, if you have extenuating circumstances, and you need to, to do more than that, you'll have to appeal and you, your appeal could be, could be denied. Um, am I missing anything on this part? Um, maybe we can move to the, to the next slide. I'm going to pass this over, on, over to um, Aiden. And of course, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions um, at the end of our presentation. So as Sophie mentioned, we are here as your support team. It's, and of course, as athletes, you have your, your teams and your coaches. Uh, you also have community and with your other students. So BPK and Claire, if you don't mind switching to the next slide, does have a BPK peer mentorship program. And there's a link there and Nicole can also post that in the chat if you need it. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, this is a program, really great program, very popular. Um, it always fills up. It's basically a chance for you as a first or a new student to be paired up with a senior BPK student. Um, so it's a really great opportunity to meet new people in the department, as well as just learn about, you know, from someone who's been there, done that, um, the ins and outs of the department, the courses, the social activities, that sort of thing. I also want to point out that um, you are eligible as well to join the Science Peer Mentorship Program, and you can join them both. Um, the link that I just put in uh, will take you to a page that has all of the uh, basically the engagement opportunities um, for science students. 
Um, so this includes the student unions. Um, you're automatically part of the student union, the BPKSA, um, as a BPK student, or even if you're intended to, um, to become, for example, behavioral neuroscience, or by virtue of even taking a BPK course, you are actually part of the student association. Um, we could switch to the next slide. Oh, and I Turn think I'm going to hand this off to here. Claire. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> All righty, thank you, Aiden. Uh, so I just wanted to say a few words about co-op, but also thinking ahead to future careers. Sophie already alluded to this and Lindsay will likely touch on it as well. It can be tricky to mix co-op with being a student athlete, but it is not impossible. We have had many students over the years who have been athletes and done really outstanding co-op placements as well. Um, Co-op is paid work experience in a field related to what you're studying. Uh, it's available for every single SFU program, including um, kinesiology, behavioral neuroscience, and biomedical physiology. Um, they're all paid. There are no unpaid internships. But in addition to the money that student, students earn while they're working, the most valuable part really is the connections they make in their field or in their industry. More than half of our students who go through co-op end up getting offered a job with one of those employers after they graduate. So it's a really excellent way to get your foot in the door, be able to try out different careers, see what you might like, uh, where you might want to go after graduation. For most students, um, we typically ask that they join the program by around the end of their second year. Uh, again, as athletes, your schedules are a little bit different, so sometimes we can make some exceptions to be able to work on co-op a little bit later uh, in your degree. Um, so the number one thing here is don't be afraid to reach out. When it comes to co-op, there is an amazing co-op team in the BPK office. I think all the science offices have great co-op teams, but in particular, Berlin and Marion uh, in BPK are really outstanding. And with that, I will pass things back to Aiden. Okay, so I just want to say a few words. Uh, we call this slide Beyond BPK, and it's just about thinking about your degree and what you want to do with it. Uh, some of you might have some ideas already, or some might be very open. Of course, BPK is a very broad program, and I mean, even the human body itself can lead to very many different uh, careers and research, um, work, all that sort of thing. Um, if you feel comfortable, I'm talking to the students here, please do maybe type in the chat things that you think that you might want to do or reasons that you, you came to BPK or, um, or you know, thoughts that you have about uh, for potential careers or um, grad school options. Um, don't be shy, but we did have, we asked this question in previous sessions. Uh, obviously there's a lot of people who are interested in the health um, field. So med school, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, uh, dentistry, veterinary medicine, um, grad school, that sort of thing, which are all great. And as Sophie mentioned, the degree does set you up well for all those. Um, I do encourage you to consider um, as many options as possible because um, there is more out there than just med school. Um, great, thanks, Kate. Um, and I, another thing I recommend students do is um, when you start thinking about um, applying to those schools, um, you, have, you want to keep in mind that most schools nowadays operate on broad-based broad admissions. So um, they're not just looking for GPA, really high GPA in courses, they're also looking for experience, right? Uh, I think student athletes in particular have wonderful experience to talk about um, in terms of their training and their competition. Um, you also want to think about um, potentially volunteer hours or work experience hours. Um, Co-op, of course, can help with that, um, but you can also get research experience in the labs. You do not have to be a graduate student to, to get research experience um, in BPK. You can do that as an undergrad. I already mentioned honors. Um, there's also uh, research grants that are available um, through Co-op. There is a directed studies course that you can do, um, which counts towards your degree. Um, so do, if you're thinking about research or grad school in the future, um, think about ways that you can um, start gaining some of that experience, even in your undergrad days. 
and um, we're happy to, to chat with you about that if you want to um, kind of flesh that out more and, and explore different ideas. Nicole put into the chat uh, the career advising link. Uh, there is a team of um, career advisors that they operate out of the Maggie Benson Center, but that's free for you to, to access. You do have access to career advising. And actually, even after your first year, after graduating from SFU, you still have access to career advising. And the next slide. So this is just our uh, just our last um, kind of page, and we'll probably leave this up even during the questions um, about who to contact and how. Um, of course, all your BPK uh, course and degree planning related questions will go to Sophie, the BPK advisor. Um, any new incoming science students can talk to Claire. It's many of you probably have already. Um, of course, you have Lindsay Buttersworth as your NCWA advisor. Um, and myself, I work in the Faculty of Science, and uh, we will have a Science Student Center opening up in the fall. So uh, Claire and myself and our colleague Thomas are going to be housed there. So we hope to meet you then. Um, I think to the next slide, we should have some. Um, perfect. So I think I'm going to hand it off to Lindsay now. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Um... I just want to start off by adding a couple things to uh, what's been said so far, just in terms of your course planning and the support team and resources that you have as BPK students, but also student athletes. Um, so when Aiden was mentioning the um, peer mentorship program, you also have a learning coach that you'll be paired with in your first year. So that is someone who is on usually on the same team as you. And we like to pair students with learning coaches in similar programs. So we have a lot of student athletes that are in BPK um, that can kind of act as mentors, very, very similar to the peer mentorship program. So just so you're aware, you'll have kind of like a buddy on your team that is hopefully in the same program or a similar program, or at least in sciences that has gone through the exact same process as you are right now, that can be super helpful. Um, and then in terms of uh, co-op, and I just want to highlight your NCAA eligibility during co-op. If you are thinking about pursuing this in the future, a lot of student athletes think that they won't be eligible to practice or compete while they're in co-op, but you actually are. So um, you are considered to be enrolled full-time while you're in co-op. So that makes you eligible to practice and compete. And like um, Claire, Sophie, and Aiden all mentioned we have lots of student athletes who have got involved in co-op in the past and have been very successful and, and made those connections and got very valuable work experience. Um, I think it's definitely a challenge for student athletes who think that either they won't be eligible while in co-op or it just doesn't work with their schedule. But what a lot of student athletes do is um, co-op usually in their off season. So if you have a semester where you're not competing as much or not competing at all, that's usually a good time to think about a co-op semester where you're working full time. Um, and then just in terms of course planning, um, that those resources are awesome um, that Sophie shared for course planning. The only thing to note is that a lot of student athletes will take that are in sciences and especially in BPK will think about taking a summer class. So that does allow you to potentially get those prereqs out of the way while also um, making your year long course load just a little bit um, less heavy on the sciences, especially for your first year. So that is an option to think about if it works for you. Um, and then just the other thing is to be careful when taking two science courses with lab components. So um, what Sophie mentioned with um, kind of splitting up potentially Chem 120 and 125, um, that might be a good option if you're taking another science course with a lab. But of course, we can always help you um, plan for that. And now I'll get on to the slides that I am actually supposed to be talking about. Um, so in terms of your eligibility, 
if you could go back to the other slide, um, the one just before, yeah, perfect. Um, so this is a slide that you'll see many times throughout your time at SFU. We really hammer this into you as a student athlete, just being aware of your eligibility in terms of academics and what you need to achieve. Um, so as you know, you need to be enrolled in a minimum of 12 units in the fall and spring semesters. Always, this is in order for you to be eligible to practice and compete. Um, and then at a very minimum, you need to pass nine units each term. Ideally, you want to be passing your 12 units, but if you are, um, if you have only passed nine units, that's the very minimum to stay eligible. And then 24 units across the whole year. So if you do pass nine units in the fall, nine units in the spring, then you will have to make up six units in the summer term towards your eligibility. If you pass 12 and 12, then you're good to go and you've passed your 24 units across the whole year. And then you always need to maintain a 2.0 cumulative GPA. So that's among all of your courses that you've taken at SFU so far. And then this is kind of looking a little bit into the future, but just as a timeline, a lot of you are already declared in your major, um, but just to be aware that you need to be declared in your major by the start of your third year. So if you are looking at intending into one of the BPK programs, you'll want to look to the internal transfer process to be able to apply and be admitted into your major by the start of your third year. So that's a good timeline to work towards those required courses that you need uh, in order to pursue the internal transfer. And then from your third year on, I'll touch on this a little bit in the next slide, but um, it's really important that all your courses are counting towards your intended major or your declared major. So um, as Sophie mentioned before, when you kind of get caught in the prerequisites and keeping an eye on meeting those prerequisite courses for further BPK courses, that's when that comes into play later on when all of your courses that you take from your third year onwards need to count towards your major. So that's why you want to plan accordingly early on so that you are able to meet those progress towards degree rules. And then this one's a sneaky one. Um, last point is to make sure you're meeting the minimum grade requirements in each of your courses. So for BPK, um, this is a C minus in, I think, all of the required courses, right, Sophie? Um, I think you need a minimum C minus in all the required courses for your BPK program, um, so not a D. So that's something to be aware of. If you did get a D or you maybe failed a course, you would have to repeat that course in the future in order for it to count towards your program. Lindsay, that's, that's the case in almost all cases. Um, mm -hmm. I believe that some MBB courses require a C. Okay. So, yeah. um, there may be specific courses and that will be stated in the calendar description in the prerequisites. They will tell you which courses require a C instead of a C minus. Perfect. Yeah. So that's definitely something to be aware of and keep an eye on. Um, and we are always we're tracking your progress too as your advisors to make sure you're meeting those eligibility rules. So um, someone will be reaching out to you if if you're in that situation because we check your transcript after every semester. Um, and then just a little bit more on progress towards degree. So uh, taking 12 units each fall and spring is usually around a five year graduation plan. So just so you're aware of that timeline, of course, this would change if you are taking more courses in the fall and spring semesters or potentially taking courses over the summer. Um, things like co-op and um, if you're going to potentially pursue honors, um, things like that can affect the timeline, but at very generally you're at kind of looking at a five-year graduation plan. And then from your third year on, like I mentioned before, your courses must be progressing you towards your degree program. So um, that's, again, when the prerequisites come into play and um, elective space, things like that. So you just want to make sure you are planning accordingly. Um, and then I kind of mentioned all these things already. And Sophie 
touched on the continuance GPAs, um, but again, summer is always an option. I know it's not um, a lot of students first choice or some students aren't able to take summer classes, but um, we are really fortunate to have a trimester system where it can be an option for most courses, especially those um, science first and second year science courses. So that's kind of all I had, um, but we can get to questions and um, we're all here to answer, answer any questions that you might have. Yeah. I'll also add, we're a really small group. I think we have like three or four students attending. So if you're feeling brave, you can unmute yourself and turn on your audio or video, but don't feel like you have to. The chat is also absolutely an option. Perhaps as we're just waiting for questions to come in, I have one quick comment and then a question for Lindsay. First, I'll maybe start with the question. Do you have AC in your house? Because how are you wearing a sweater right now? Or are you still not in the province? <laughs> yes, I'm here. I'm at home now. And we do have AC. We live in a basement suite. That's why. OK. I was like, how on earth is she in that sweater and not sweating up a storm? Uh, and then my second thing, which is just a comment, is congratulations, Lindsay. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> folks who are watching may not know that in addition to all of her work as the NCAA advisor, Lindsay is also uh, a very talented athlete herself and had a really fantastic, I was going to say weekend, week. Yeah, it's been a, it was like, <laughs> uh, a long few days, but um, yeah, it was very good. Uh, and <laughs> I'm still just kind of in a daze and <laughs> I just flew in from Montreal. So it's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay, All remind right. us what it is that you compete in? I've forgotten. I run the 800. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the first time that I like got to know Lindsay when we first started working together many years ago, I knew that she ran, but I was like, do you run fa fast or long time? And I was like, hmm, <laughs> middle distance. That's, both. that's how I learned that word. <laughs> Yeah. All right, we have a couple of questions that have started coming in. Uh, first okay. question comes from Brandon who asks, will this recording be posted on the website so I can watch it again? Um, this is being recorded. I, I believe Nicole will be emailing this out um, and the other presentations were posted. So I think this one will be too, but at the very least you'll definitely get it over email. Uh, Kate asks, what do we do if we can't get our classes to work with our training schedule? Uh, Lindsay or Sophie, I think either of you would be great to answer that if one of you wants to take a stab first. So I'm going to jump in and I do want Lindsay to jump in as well. And our faculty members um, across campus, we want to work with um, athletes and we want to make things work. But because we keep talking about um, prerequisites, I always say to students, Sometimes you can juggle which term you take a course in if it fits better with your, um, your schedule, your practice schedule, but sometimes you can't. And sometimes you just have to take a course and then you have to chat with your coach and you have to let them know that on a particular day, you might have to miss a practice. You might have to come to a practice late. If you're uncomfortable with that, you can reach out to Lindsay maybe um, but you just, you can't get behind in your prerequisites um, because you, 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 you're at practice. You are both a, you are a student and an athlete. And so my perspective is you're a student first. Now some, your coach may think you're an athlete first, right? Um, and that's why I want to hear Lindsay's perspective on this as well. Um, and so sometimes it is, you've got a bit of flexibility but sometimes you don't. And the courses are not going to run because remember, some athletes are swimmers, some are soccer players, some play football. We can't make our courses fit every athlete's training schedule. It's just impossible. So I don't know if that sort of touched on it all, Lindsay. Do you have anything to add to that? I think generally in your first year, we are going to have enough options to make it work. Um, so if you come back to us and you're really struggling to find something that fits in your practice schedule, we can definitely help you. If you're really stuck and you actually can't find anything that works um, and you've met with us already and it's just a huge challenge, which doesn't usually happen, but 
Um, if that does happen, then we recommend that you have a conversation with your coach. Um, as Sophie said, we say you are a student first and an athlete second as well, because you can't compete in your sport unless you are successful in your academics. So um, come in and talk to us to see if there are other options. Um, and then if you are worried about talking to your coach, we can also help connect you um, and explain the situation from our side as well. But um, for the most part in your first year, you shouldn't have an issue. Um, the other thing I will say is that sometimes you will end up um, not being able to take the courses that you need and might need to take a summer class. So that has happened in the past too. Um, so that's another conversation we'll have with you individually to see if that is realistic for you. Um, because we understand that like financially and um, sometimes just geographically, if you don't live in, in BC and you need to go home for the summer, um, that isn't an option. So just come and talk to us and we can help you figure out a solution. Thank you, Ralph Lindsay and Sophie. I, I, just want to, I just want to add to that and maybe it's um, as varsity athletes, you will sometimes be competing. Um, there is an exception to what we've just said in the sense that sometimes you might be on the road um, and you may have to miss a class because you're on the road or you may even have to miss a midterm or something like that. In that case, the faculty members, if you are coded as if you're if you're coded as a varsity athlete, um, arrangements can be made in those particular situations. So um, and and the profs are very um, accommodating, especially with advance notice. Um, and that's you know I don't know if Lindsay can chat a bit more about that or if if we need to today, uh, but I just want you to know that there that's a different circumstance, right? Mm -hmm. That is. Um, you know, uh, a one-off for a midterm or, um, you know, a class, uh, one or two classes during the term. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really good point to bring up. Um, usually what you'll get at the beginning of the semester is a missed class letter. So that's given out to all student athletes that you will go to your coach with and fill out the dates that you may be traveling or could be missing class or basically that you're just not here. And that is what you will give to all of your professors in the first week of classes um, that just basically lets them know that you're a student athlete. It's a good opportunity to introduce yourself as well. Um, to your professors and that allows them to have um, a lot of notice that you might be missing class and from there they can kind of say yes we'll be accommodating which is what happens most of the time sometimes professors like very rarely aren't able to accommodate student athletes and in that case we um, recommend that you come back to us and we find another course option for you to get into because there isn't a actually an SFU policy that requires professors to make accommodations for missed classes. So if you're in that position, that's why we um, definitely recommend that you go to your professors in the first week so that if that happens by chance, you have enough time to switch around your schedule if you need to. Thank you both. And I just want to add to that, that as part of the accommodation process, and I don't know if, if, if most profs are willing to do this, you know, it's, it's up to them, but I have known varsity athletes to be on the road, to be in their hotel and to be writing a midterm with somebody just invigilating. Mm -hmm. so that's what I mean, there's all kinds of different solutions and that is sometimes one of the solutions. You get to write, you get to write the midterm and um, it's just, you're somewhere else. You're not on campus to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, and your prof, by letting them know right at the beginning of the term, you can discuss those kind of accommodations, right? So. Yeah. Alrighty, this next question comes from Jenna who asks, what's the first year English requirement? Is there a specific English course that we need? Um, so you may have heard through university prep or just around, uh, you might've heard the acronym WQB, Writing Quantitative and Breadth, and Aiden touched on this a little earlier as well, very long-winded way to say electives. Um, those writing intensive courses, you need to do at least one at the lower division, first or second year. 
and at least one at the upper division, third or fourth year. Um, but it doesn't have to be English. And there are a number of courses, and I can see Nicole's just popped the link in the chat. Thank you, Nicole. That can meet that W requirement. There are W's in philosophy. There are W's in criminology. Uh, there are W's in a fair number of science programs, actually. It's any type of course where you're evaluated mostly on written assignments, as opposed to things like midterms and final exams. Uh, anything anyone else would like to add about W's or English courses? I told you are absolutely correct, Claire, that um, you students don't have to do an English course. You can do Education 100. Education 100 is both a breadth humanities and also a W. So it will satisfy both requirements, but it still only counts as three units, mm -hmm. right? It's, saying, it's satisfying two requirements, but you can't uh, count it as six units. Mm -hmm. But having said that, remember what I said about if you are interested in professional programs, once you, once you graduate, or if you're able to get into medicine after your, your third year, medicine requires six units of English. Mm -hmm. So knowing the same thing with your breath social sciences, lots of crim courses are breath social sciences. Um, I'm trying to think what some other breath social sciences are. Um, but if you're interested in doing a master's in physical therapy, and I think a couple of you said you are, they require three units of psychology. So you could do you could do two psychology courses, and that would satisfy your two uh, requirements for your your two breath social sciences. Mm -hmm. You may not be crazy about psychology, so you may only do the one psychology course to satisfy the requirements for uh, PT. If you want to keep your options open between PT and OT, occupational therapy requires either a human geography or a sociology anthropology course. Well, sociology, anthropology, a lot of the first year sociology, anthropology courses happen to also be VSOS. Mm -hmm. So knowing what you want to go into um, helps you when you're picking those, um, those elective courses, breath humanities, uh, breath social sciences. Okay, so English is not required unless you're med school bound. Psychology is not required. You need it if you're thinking of PT. I'll give a plug for the drama English class. It's my favorite. I think it's the most fun, but again, you don't have to take English if you don't want to. <laughs> I believe we're all caught up on the questions in the chat. I'll give it a moment in case any others pop in before we wrap up. Can I uh, just perhaps, say that we, yeah. have, we have two different slides on who to contact. And the oh. one that we showed earlier doesn't have Lindsay on it. And uh, so could we so could we please go to the last slide where Lindsay is actually this one. Thank you. Um, so Lindsay's um, contact email is here. And I do apologize that uh, Lindsay wasn't listed on the who to contact uh, slide 18, I believe. Um, and uh, so yeah, here's we're all here again with our um, email addresses, including Lindsay. Sorry, Lindsay. All good. Well, not seeing any other questions popping in, perhaps we can go ahead and wrap things up. It is almost five o'clock. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to all of our speakers today and Nicole on the back end for taking care of getting this organized and recorded. Uh, as we said, this will be sent out to you afterwards, uh, probably if not later this week, then early next. Um, but all in all, I hope you're all doing well, staying safe, and we look forward to seeing you this fall. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye everybody. Care.